Hello everyone, my name is Kellen Ness and this is a Sullivan Farm workshop. This is our first workshop and I'm joined here by Kip Kolsinskes. He's a consulting conservation scientist with over 40 years of experience and he works here statewide throughout Connecticut. And here is his presentation titled Sustainable Agriculture 101. Kip, thank you for joining us. Thank you very much. And thanks again to Lisa Beth and Sullivan Farm for the invitation and for those that uh, choose to, to watch this. So look forward to sharing what I've some of what I've learned over 40 years makes oh. me sound old. Thanks a no. lot. <laughs> so, but anyways, um, again, um, it's a, a topic as we think about agriculture, as we think about um, hearing people talk about regenerative ag, sustainable agriculture. So we're going to talk about that. And what does that mean? What does that include? So, so let's get started. So again, um, as we think about you know what's what's happened and what's happening in the world, we know that agriculture and the food system is impacted all the time, and uh, it's only getting more intense with the impacts of climate change, the globalization of everything, pandemics, uh, war, scarcity of resources, the fact that by 2050 we need to feed 9.5 to 10 billion people. So. How are we going to do that? And can we do that without, uh, you know, destroying the rest of the resources on the planet, let alone the differences between culture and religion and ethics and value and economics? And then also the fact that we really would like to leave the planet in uh, a decent shape for the next generation, for future generations. So and I think certainly um, agriculture and the food system can play a really important part in uh, sustainability. So again, as we think about and people talk about agriculture and the negative impacts of agriculture on natural resources and on the planet, and yes, there, there have been. And I would say that's, if you take a look at where agriculture has gotten to of an industrialized global food system, and I think everyone thought that globalization was you know, going to cure all the ills for everyone, um, and though it, there have been so many unintended consequences. So are there additional ways of doing things? And I think as we explore um, sustainable agriculture, regenerative agriculture, there are different ways of feeding ourselves and taking care of the natural resources. So let's let's first we'll look at the, you know, the, the bad and the ugly uh, as relates to the current um, negative impacts that can be associated with an industrialized food system. It doesn't mean that this is true every place. There are certainly plenty of farms and farmers and agricultural systems that are not contributing these things, but it can result in polluted runoff, uh, loss of natural areas, biodiversity, polluted groundwater, overused surface and groundwater contamination from pesticides, antibiotic resistance, uh, contributing to emissions that are very damaging from a, a climate change perspective. Methane is a, a particularly uh, bad emission as relates to climate change. Impacts on animal welfare, uh, change in our diet of having nutritionally poor foods, decline in rural communities as you've had this consolidation of, of farms and uh, loss of farm ownership among people, people becoming uh, tenant farmers. Reduce food security, environmental justice for a lot of people. Not everyone has access to, to food. And in general, worldwide, a lot of negative impacts on women, children, and indigenous people. And again, as, as you're looking at this, this concept of uh, efficiency um, through clustering of, um, of, of businesses, and efficiency of scale that we've had a loss of diversity of of genetics varieties breeds cultural practices and and local knowledge so let's see what are some other ways that we can do things so again there are so many terms that people hear and so what do they all mean so Lisa, Beth, and I were talking a little bit about this, so I just thought I would talk a little bit about some of this different vocabulary that people may be exposed to, and some of it has some real differences to it, and some, 
you know, it depends, depends on who you talk to. So conventional agriculture, typically when people are talking about conventional agriculture, that would uh, mean to a lot of people that they're, they're using pesticides, they're using petroleum based pesticides and fertilizers. Um, and they're, you know, using conventional tillage practices, things like that. That's what some people would think that means. Industrial agriculture, people also talk about factory farms. Again, there is no strict definition. I think that's really more of a, a size. And we have these large aggregations of animals or of cropland that people would consider that to be industrial agriculture or, or factory farming. Um, organic agriculture, if you're looking at the definition, the USDA definition of, of organics and organic production, it actually does have some specific standards to it. Regenerative agriculture, again, is a newer terminology to a lot of people. And though historically, the, some of those concepts go all the way back to the 1940s with, uh, with Rodale of bringing forward those ideas of regenerative agriculture. It's basically similar to concepts of sustainable agriculture, of working more with nature, that the concepts that you're going to use are um, with, you know, trying to reduce the amount of nutrients um, to do things with nature rather than against nature. Climate smart agriculture is a new term that uh, USDA is, is using, and that really relates to conservation practices, which we'll talk a little bit more about, that can help us mitigate emissions and help us adapt to climate change and build resiliency to agriculture and the food system. Holistic agricultural management, another concept of uh, kind of a whole systems approach, and uh, particularly that's been very popular out west with grazing management systems of holistic agricultural management. Permaculture, again, permaculture, again, is, is farming with nature, using ecological principles of nature, particularly as relates to water and energy, as relates to a farming operation. Agroforestry, there's a bunch of different concepts under agro, agroforestry, but it's basically combining you know, trees and shrubs with other kinds of, of agriculture and kind of subsets of that are um, our silvopasture and forest farming and alley cropping, some of those kinds of things. Whole farm planning is, again, this concept of really looking at the whole farm and looking at the interactions between the different elements on a farm and trying to make sure that they're in sync and uh, minimizing the natural resource impacts. Conservation plan is like a management plan that you would use for any of these concepts to make sure that you're, you're not degrading the environment, that you're um, doing things so that your economic activity that, you know, cause overall farming is, um, is a business. So you want it to make, to be a business now and also a business in the future that's sustainable. And conservation practice and best management practices are basically those kinds of, of uh, concepts of engineering or agronomic or soil management that we know are based on research, based on engineering and science principles. And we know that if you do a certain thing that you're going to get a certain kind of a result. So I know that's a lot of different, different terms. So looking a little bit about this idea of regenerative agriculture, which basically the concept, well, maybe something is broken or maybe something is degraded and you're going to restore it and then um, uh, keep it in a, in a state where it's, it's sustainable over a long period of time. And I guess that's one thing that, you know, maybe the jury is out. Do we really know whether or not we can keep, we can feed 10 billion people and have agriculture and and that's sustainable on the planet. I mean, we've only been farming for about 10, 12,000 years as a, as a, a species. Mm -hmm. So the, the jury's out whether we can, we can pull it off, but I'm certainly willing to give it a try and I know you are oh, yes. <laughs> as, Definitely. as well. So um, looking at some of these principles of regenerative or sustainable agriculture. So let's just go through those and talk a little bit about it. So again, typically means improving soil health, reducing 
you know, pesticide fertilizer use, increasing biodiversity, trying to uh, sequester, get carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, store it as carbon in the soil, humane treatment of people and animals, improvement protect ecosystems. So on a, on a, on a kind of a broader scale or a higher level maybe of principles is you're gonna disturb the soil as little as possible, keep the soil covered, keep living roots in the soil, grow a diversity of crops. And then particularly for the regenerative ag folks, they think it's really important to, to integrate grazing animal and livestock back to the land or as part of the farming system. And then it's also a, a philosophy of, of land management, of connecting agriculture to natural and human communities, that it's a dynamic system, adaptive management. You try something, if it doesn't work, you try something out. See That's if it works. I'm sure you do that all the yeah. all the time. If you're going to be successful, focusing on on managing the soil, the soil health, the soil quality, valuing the ecosystem services, trying to work with the other components of the ecosystem on the farm, um, and then also I think there's a lot to be learned with um, with practices from different cultures and from indigenous communities. So of course a lot of things that we think that um, that we developed, you know. People yeah. in other other cultures uh, have been doing those a long time, exactly. And or we're rediscovering, for instance, the whole uh, um, use of fire management as a management mm -hmm. tool in uh, fire-based ecosystems. It's a good example. So the other thing is that we can't have this conversation without talking about climate change and the impacts of climate change. And I really like this graphic that I think it really shows about all of the kinds of things that we need to need to think about as relates to mitigation and adaptation and it's just changing and needs to change the farm and food system all over the world you know some portions of uh, the planet are not going to be able to grow some of the crops that they've traditionally grown for instance with rising sea levels a lot of those areas that um, are deltas that uh, uh, and floodplains in Southeast Asia that where most of the rice is produced are gonna be flooded, they're gonna be brackish. They're not gonna be able to grow rice there. Or there are places like, you know, we were talking about maple syrup production. Maybe there are parts of the of the, the Northeast that we're no longer gonna be, have a viable maple maple syrup industry because it's, uh, you know, you don't have the, uh, the right kind of growing conditions or too short of a growing yes. season to make it economically viable. And that we know that um, we're gonna need to change how we eat and how we farm. Uh, with intense rainfall events, you know, if you have bare soil, you're gonna get erosion. And that some places are going to, it's going to be so hot that it can really um, impact plants, as I'm sure you've seen with some of the hot weather, that peppers and eggplants can start to drop their flowers and uh, ab abort their fruit and some of those kinds of things. And, um, you know, I mean, one of my favorite apples is a Macintosh apple, and that's an apple that requires quite a bit of cold temperature mm. to grow. So we're going to be able to grow Macintosh in, in Connecticut, and we're going to need to eat differently. You know, eat a little lower on the food chain, eat less meat, mm. eat more grass-fed meat, more legumes. So, and though um, worldwide, more extreme weather events, we've seen that, floods and droughts, high temperature stress on crops, new pests and diseases, part of that is the globalization, part of it is just as areas get warmer, even in Connecticut, we've seen um, diseases and insect pests winter over that didn't used to winter over here mm -hmm. or have established themselves here from farther south. And then I think probably the most difficult thing is the less predictable weather of not knowing when your first and last frost date are and how much rain you're gonna get mm -hmm. in a month. And though we're fortunate here in the Northeast, we're gonna have adequate water. We're gonna have not enough some years, too much other oh, years, but overall, if we can manage it well, we should have a, a pretty decent Balanced. climate for people and for agri most forms of agriculture and we have the really potential to expand and diversify. So, you know, if you think that all of your fresh fruits and vegetables are gonna come from uh, the Southwest or the uh, West Coast of South America, they're not because there's no water. There's not gonna be any water. So we have an, we have an opportunity to gain some market advantage. And, you know, already in the, in the Northeast, we have 24% of the population. So we're in the heart of one of the marketplaces. 
So how are farmers adapting to, to mitigating climate change? And is this consistent with some of these regenerative ag principles? So some of the things that people are doing is doing a risk assessment. You know, how much risk do you have? If all of your land that you farm is on a floodplain, you've got a lot of risk, a lot of risk there. Diversification, you know, again, if you have uh, not, if you're just planting tomatoes, and I guess for a lot of people, this was not a good year for tomatoes because just when the tomatoes were becoming ripe, they got rained on and mm. tomatoes don't like to be rained on. So if you had a variety of crops, you're better off. Improvements to soil health, conservation practices, and newly adopted production systems. So we'll take a look at some of that and what does it mean. So diversification to me means, it can mean you know your markets. Uh, if you were strictly trying to do wholesale, that's a, that's a tough business. Uh, the kind of crops, the breeds of animals, um, the kinds of products, the idea of added value products, your household income, and as I said, even the the land use. If you if all of your um, land is was on a on a floodplain, you know that's you have a lot of risk there. So diversification, newly adopted production system. You know, I'd say um, I'm sure you folks like your high tunnels. You know, as far as extending the growing season, being able to manage moisture and insect and disease pressure, I think that's that's really been been critical using mulches and row covers. As I said, different crops, uh, varieties and breeds. This idea of low uh, pre-harvest investment crops. Again, if you were concentrating on tomatoes, but it was a bad year of tomatoes, maybe if you had done some, you know, some some spinach and some radish early in the season, maybe you'd still get some, some income. And flood and drought resistant crops, in some cases, that's one of those things that the, you know, the seed growers are really looking at is that uh, of what crops and what varieties are more more resistant. I'm sure you notice some varieties do better, oh, better than others. And then, um, use of compost and biochar trying to get as much organic carbon and organic matter in the soil and then going to perennial crop systems because uh, typically a lot of perennial crops are better adapted to that variability so including some of that so you might ask why is jamie jones from shelton family farm standing out in this field saying uh what practices can i use and actually jones uh, family farms in Shelton, really. I don't know if you've ever been there or not, yes, but I they know. use a lot of these these principles. You know, mm -hmm. they're a very diverse operation from pick your own to an added value product like wine. Um, they have a lot of sloping land, so they're very careful about the practices. They knew use uh, no-till, reduced tillage. Right here he's standing in a field. It might look like corn, but it's actually sorghum. And he's using that as a green manure crop, so he's going to He's going to mulch it and then plow it down and really get a lot of organic matter in the soil with that. And it also helps with weed control yeah. as well. And so you're wondering, well, why isn't everyone using these regenerative or sustainable ag practices? And, uh, you know, there's a lot of different reasons. I would say a lot of it is 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 um, a risk management perspective, you know, to try to do something different there's risk involved. So as we look at what are some of the constraints are, you know, again, some of it are physical and ecological limits. Again, if you're, you know, if all your land's on a floodplain, there's not much you're going to be able to do about that. Technological limits, um, you know, do we have all the varieties that we need with the resistance that's necessary? Financial barriers, you know, if you really would like to, to go to a reduced tillage or, or no-till, you know, depending on the size of equipment, you can spend from, you know, 20000 to to $100,000 for a piece of no-till yeah, equipment. Yeah, easy. Yeah, and that's, so not everybody can afford that or even necessarily has the need to be able to justify that. So informational barriers, does, do people have the information that they need, the technical information? And um, in some cases, w for some of these things, you know, we really need to have the, the research done. We really don't know. On, you know, for some of these pests, like uh, you're hearing a lot about the spotted lanternfly, we really don't know what the effects are going to be or how to control it, or even the, the spotted wing drosophila on berries. We really don't have a great strategy yet for, uh, for yeah. controlling that. Yep. Cognitive barriers, uh, again, uh, that uh, risk of uncertainty, you know, should I spend the money on an irrigation system? 
I got through this year, but are we going to have, is next year going to be a wet year? Or is it going to be a dry year? We don't know. Social and cultural barriers. We all know within our own families, you know, in some cases, well, this is, we do it this way because this is the way dad did it or grandpa yeah. did it. So that can be, that can be a barrier to doing things different. Uh, regulatory institutional barriers, for example, on crop insurance that they were uh, penalizing people for cover crops, growing cover crops on fields where they were growing commodity crops. So I think they finally have that straightened out. So there's some of those kinds of things that need to be straightened out. And then land tenure barriers. You know, in Connecticut, over half of farms rely partly or all on leased land. So if you don't know from year to year whether or not you're going to have that field to rent, are you going to make these major investments in soil health or a new piece of equipment? Exactly. And you don't know whether you're going to have it again. The land or not. Yeah, that's exactly. right. So that's, that's a barrier too. So to me, all of these principles and the way to really integrate them and get them to work um, in concert and moving towards that path of regeneration and sustainability is to use in the context of a conservation plan where you're looking at things for addressing short-term needs and long-term objectives. And again, as, as you know as well, the objective too is that farms are businesses, so they need to be economically viable. Mm -hmm. So uh, the idea of a conservation plan is you're gonna take these, these management systems um, and you're gonna use conservation practices to address the resource concerns and move you towards where you wanna go. So there's various components to that. So we'll talk about what some of these components are for a, a conservation plan. So part of it is that it's, um, it's gonna address your soil health, your plant health, air quality. You want it to be as comprehensive as possible. Energy conservation, uh, water quality, quantity, animal health, wildlife habitat, and of course, you know, particularly here in Connecticut, our working lands are expected to do so many things. So people have these expectations as far as scenic views or and I'm sure the, uh, here because you have walking trails, you have scenic vistas and people have certain expectations. Like I know I've, I've heard criticism in some communities. Oh, those ugly high tunnels. And though it's blocking my scenic vista. And though that's helping keep the farm in business because they're extending the growing One season. season. So to adapt to the climate, right. To adapt to the climate. Yep. And so the first thing as far as this conservation planning is to do a resource inventory. So again, to know what resources that you have that are what, you know, uh, what kind of state are they in? Uh, is your, are your soils in good health? Do you have an erosion problem? Do you have a runoff problem? So address those, look at those, and inventory that such as we were talking about you know how come you really haven't uh done any sugaring here on this property so mm -hmm. well there really are not enough of a density of sugar maples so you've done that resource inventory here already yes. going to determine your objectives and opportunities so you guys have done that you know what your mission is what you want to get done here and you've analyzed the resource data and then you've made some some decisions. So that's really the first step to conservation planning. Collect and analyze. Then you're going to develop your, your management strategies based on this site specific information. Like you know you have some sloping land. So you're not going to try to put that into intensive vegetable uh, production. You have some flatter areas that you're, that you're using for that. And you're going to incorporate practice, uh, practice standards. So for instance, um, you know, you're not going to try to take too many cuttings of hay off without mm -hmm. adding some nutrients back to the soil. And that, um, you know, we talked a little bit about controlling invasives as well. So there are actually conservation practice standards that have been developed by USDA Natural Resources Conservation Service in consultation with the universities, with, um, with other organizations, um, with uh, Agricultural Research Service to be able to know that if you do a certain practice, you're going to get a certain kind of result. Then you're going to schedule your implementation of practices. So if you know that you're, that cover crops are going to be beneficial because they're going to add organic matter, they're going to help you with, uh, with weed control, they're going to keep the soil covered, prevent against erosion, you know when you've got to get those planted by. Yeah. So that would be the implementation of a practice. Or if you have a, 
you know, a, a farm road that has a, a runoff problem, you know that there are designs, engineering designs that you can use so that it's not going to continue to be an erosion problem on your on your farm road. And then you're going to evaluate the effectiveness and recalibrate. So if something doesn't work, you're going to try Again. something something different. So as we talk about what are some of these common best management practices that people are using for sustainable ag and regenerative uh, agriculture, probably a lot of them relate to the cropping systems. So again, if you have uh, sloping land, you want to do your tillage across the slope. You may do strips of, of row crops and strips of like uh, a grass or a close growing crop. You're going to manage your residue. That's the stuff on the surface. You may try to do reduce tillage or no-till. That's one of those things that, uh, too, that Joneses do on some of their sloping land is they'll plant a cover crop and then um, roll it and crimp it or kill it and then plant their pumpkins and squash right into there. So the soil's covered. It has a nice um, base for the, the squash and pumpkins to sit on and the fields that they don't irrigate, they said that actually held enough moisture that I actually got a pretty decent yield in this this drought year. Mm -hmm. So I don't know what your experience has been on with mulches and trying to keep the soil covered, but you yeah. can capture a lot of moisture that way. Oh, definitely. You can definitely keep the retention up. Yeah. Right. And then here's just a little graphic here. And you can see on the left is uh, soil loss in tons per acre from zero to 10. And on the right hand is the amount of water runoff. And then across the bottom is either conventional tillage where you're, you know, you're going to do a moldboard plow. Then you're going to do other tillage operations to get it ready to plant the seed. No till would be not doing any tillage. Um, and then all the way to right is a double crop, which is something of no till where you're growing something. You know, it might be wheat, winter wheat, it might be rye, it might be triticale, and then you're actually harvesting that and then killing that and then planting into it. So there's more and more people that are doing some double cropping system. But you can see on the chart here that your soil loss goes right down and you're using less water, um, the less disturbance of the soil. So that's kind of what that chart is showing. And uh, it's good for the soil health too. Other cropping systems, again, we talked about cover crops of planting stuff so you don't have bare earth. In, and a lot of the uh, organic uh, producers, even um, if there's a short period of time where the earth is, is bare, they'll plant something like buckwheat or something just to get some cover on the soil, keep living roots in the soil. Using mulches, compost, helps control weeds, keeps moisture in the ground. And then it, to me, that's really helpful as far as drought resilience. So this is something, the organic matter holds moisture. And a lot of Connecticut soils are actually sandy. Uh, sandy loam is our most dominant soil mm -hmm. texture. So it holds a, a, it holds a fair amount of moisture, but in a drought year, yeah, it no. doesn't really hold enough, does it? No. So, so one thing you can do is keep your organic matter level up. And I like this statistic. For every 1% of increase in organic matter, it'll hold another inch of water available to plants. Um, and then also when we have the wet years, and you, we know a wet year will be coming again, that having that extra organic matter in the soil acts as a cushion. So if you're in there doing activities in the field when maybe you shouldn't, it acts like a little bit of a cushion. So you're likely to get less compaction if you have adequate organic matter levels in the in the soil so and again that's what this is showing is the difference between an undisturbed uh soil and a compacted soil and compacted soils basically you're squeezing it so you have less air space you have less um pore space for roots to go down through for water and air to go down through so compaction is bad mm. and then cropping systems uh Thinking about it from a, a whole perspective of rotating your crops, rotating your crops can help with, um, with insect and disease prevention and infestation and uh, weed suppression, uh, going to more, as we talked about, perennial crop systems, which can be more resilient, can add diversity to your, to your farm. This whole idea of silvopasture, we're actually having people 
put trees back into pastures. You think about it for two reasons. One, of course, a lot of the, the breeds of cattle in particular that we use are Northern European breeds. And when it's, you get 30 days of 90 degrees, they don't want to eat. Mm -hmm. And Holsteins shade. don't want to produce milk when it's that hot. So if you can put some shade in the pasture and they have some place to get out of the heat, they'll eat in the in the morning and the in the late afternoon and evening. So and then, you know, can you put in crops that also can give you some other um, economic values? So whether it's, you know, managing some big some big sugar maples out there mm. or something for saw logs or um, fruit, or fruit or nuts. So there are people that are doing these various various kinds of systems. And then also, you know, forest farming, planting things in there in the forest, edge of the forest, managing those, and this idea of alley cropping where you actually might have like, you know, uh, fruit trees that you're managing. Um, and then in between your, your haying or grazing in between these rows of, of fruit trees or nut trees. And then, you know, the another big uh, principle of regenerative sustainable ag is being really careful and strategic and, you know, stingy almost with your, your pesticides and your nutrients and how you manage them. And again, as you know, there's this mis misconception that organic agriculture doesn't use any nutrients, doesn't use any pesticides. It's just you're using different right. classes of them that in right. general have less toxicity to it. But still, even then, you one, they cost money and they can impact the health of the farm workers and the environment, so you don't want to use them. So doing soil testing, um, this whole concept of precision agriculture, giving you know, just the right amount of nutrients at the right place at the right time when the plant can use it, uh, like the concept for sweet corn of doing a June nitrate test, just when it's getting to like seven to 14 inches high before it's going to put on that big growth spur to do a soil test then again to know how much nitrogen that they're going to need rather than applying it all. And of course, the other thing we're finding with, with climate change, with these intense rainfall events, if you just put down all your fertilizer and you get five inches of rain, where, where is it going to go? One spot. Yeah. <laughs> so, and then being careful with your irrigation water. You know, again, as we know, a lot of people did uh, struggled with having enough irrigation water this year. So being very careful, you know, using uh, uh, drip and trickle and mulches to help you maximize your use. I like, I saw that you actually have a little bit of a cistern that you're capturing some roof runoff. Oh, yes, Good job. Are. Excellent. Yeah, that's what I tell anybody that has a farm structure. If you have, if you have gutters, you should be capturing water. You might not use it every year, but it but could really help. Have, yeah. That's oh, right. When we needed it, we were, uh, the Great Brook out back of uh, Sullivan Farm actually ended up drying up at one point. We were worried that it was going to drain our pond too much to where it was going to hurt our well and we weren't right. going to be able to have any water for the crops. But uh, fortunately, uh, we had saved some water and uh, we were able to scrape on by and now everything's starting to right. get back into Yeah, it's starting to re recover water, the soil moisture and the water table are starting to recover now. So, and then also, as we talked about, irrigation water management, and then again, protecting those sensitive parts of the landscape of, of, with, of uh, wetlands and water courses with buffer strips and field borders. So when we get these intense rainfall events, you know, if you have erosion, if you have nutrients moving, that they're going to get captured before they get into the into the water. And then, as we know too, that um, you know, Connecticut is the the models are showing that overall Connecticut's getting wetter. If you look at the uh, the rainfall data from the you know 1950s, 60s of Connecticut to where we are now, we're we're two to three inches wetter depending on where you are in the state. Mm. So if you have soils that were on the wet side before. They're only going to get wetter. So I think you're going to see more drainage systems, uh, surface drains, subsurface drains. In the middle picture is some raised beds. I don't know if you guys have a bed maker. We do. Yeah. And I think that can be really valuable with wet soils. Just elevating a little a little bit keeps it a little a little drier, a little warmer. While still re maintaining uh, some a key amount of moisture. Right. Yep. And then again with the regenerative agriculture folks that really want to have animals as part of the system from the 
uh, the nutrient management standpoint and the soil health standpoint, it's really important to have a managed grazing system so that you're not overgrazing, that you're 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 basically managing vegetation and livestock rather than um, you know bringing the food to the animals. So, but it requires to have fencing setups and watering setups and pathways for animals to get to the paddocks and to train the animals. Uh, of where they're supposed to go and what they're supposed to do. But it can be very effective. And again, you need to have watering systems. Um, it can really help with, uh, with pathogen control in water bodies. And then how do we manage manure? So that's you know, some of the, the challenges of these larger concentrated livestock systems uh, when an, a full-grown Holstein basically supplies the same amount of manure as seven people. So if you have a herd of a thousand animals, that's like a small city of manure that you have to deal with. So how do you yeah. deal with that? And again, if we don't want the methane emissions, you know, one of those things is that people are, are building the biodigesters to be able to capture that methane and then use those biogases to, you know, put into as far as, um, uh, a fuel or convert it to electricity, some of those kinds of things, uh, putting covers over manure, over manure systems. And then also when you have the waste um, from some of the large dairies is to, is to utilize it. You know, for instance, we don't really don't want people to do winter spreading of manure any, anymore. So you want to use the manure or the affluent when the plants can use it because they're going to uptake it and then it's not going to run off. It's not going to go in the groundwater. Um, so this is a, 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 a picture of a manure injector there. And so how do we store and manage manure when you have animal agriculture? And then even in, um, let me see here. Um, and then also there are times a year where really animals shouldn't be out there on the landscape because they're mm -hmm. just going to, you know, compact the soils, make a big mess. And so they need to be concentrated. So how do we manage that manure where they're for a short period of time that they're that they're indoors, so you might need a sacrifice area. And then of composting systems. Um, you know, I go out on a lot of farms and they're really not adequately managing their compost, either from animal and manure or even from, you know, their, uh, their, their greenhouses or their fields or, um, you know, stuff that they've chipped. And that can be really a really valuable uh, soil management system to have good quality compost that you're that you're making. And then again, as we had just talked about the farmstead management of, you know, of keeping the dirty water from the clean water is always a challenge. And around any farmstead area, where does the water go? So that, you know, because you need to have nice solid base around your mm -hmm. farm buildings and your farm roads. Um, you don't want manure water mixing with clean water. And then also, like you're doing here, is to have some cisterns and capturing some roof runoff and water and using it. And there's even systems, too, for um, capturing it off of high tunnels and greenhouses, too. So, and then, as I said, um, protecting your wellhead, um, these covered heavy use areas where you're going to put your, your, you know, say your beef animals in there for the winter on packed bedding of of straw or sawdust or whatever over the winter. And then you can pull that out in the springtime and apply it onto the, onto the fields when the plants can use it. Certainly one of air quality, energy conservation, you know, as we talk about, there's just been so much um, emphasis on energy production that not enough emphasis on energy conservation. Energy conservation is always cheaper than creating new energy sources. And as we all know, mm. you know, not everyone's house is as well insulated, has the best windows. Mm. The same with our farm structures, mm. you know, not necessarily the most efficient equipment. So there's a lot that we can do. Um, again, on-farm solar arrays, manure digesters, because we're having longer periods of sustained high winds and that the wind turbines have gotten more efficient, I think there's, there's more opportunities for small wind generation, even in our, our, our fencing systems, you know, those solar fencing systems can work okay. quite well. I don't know if you use those for a deer we fence. Do. Yeah. Yes, we do. It all works. It's perfect. Yeah. And it's so much easier than needing to constantly lug batteries or, right. or tie into the, the grid. Yeah. Yeah. 
So there's a lot more that we can do. And even, you know, there are uh, uh, programs that can help with energy audits mm -hmm. as well on farms. And then, of course, you know, because of this concept that we're going to, we're trying to farm with nature, that we want to also protect those ecosystem, other ecosystem services that well-managed farmland provides. We want to protect our riparian areas, keep animals out of the stream, protect the stream banks so they don't erode. Uh, pollinator plantings, you, prob you probably have some areas that you could try to manage a little bit to, for some pollinator uh, habitat, I would imagine. Yes. Now, do you guys have bees? We do. We yeah. have two hives, okay. and we use them mainly just for pollinators, right. actually. And, and, you know, they need a variety of different kinds of habitat oh. for the whole season to be able to, f to feed themselves. And then also another important part when we talk about whole farm planning, And as we look at climate change and because of that our, our landscapes are so fragmented to give opportunities for species, plant animal species to migrate across the landscape. Mm -hmm. So of managing our woodlots where we can doing some delayed mowing, restoring wet areas, controlling invasives so that, and planting native species, those are all really good, really good practices. And what I would like to see you know, as relates to this, as in some cases, some of these things we're talking about, there's not really a way for you to recoup those with the price that you're charging for product as a farmer, mm -hmm. uh, some ecosystem service payments for doing some of these things. And I know that there's more and more interest in that. For instance, you know, if you're in a public water supply watershed and you're managing a certain way, it seems like maybe an ecosystem payment would be, would be a good, I good idea. And then we know, as I said, these conservation practices, these concepts that uh, were developed by USDA with uh, the universities, with nonprofits, we know these things work, these conservation practices. Um, and so that we can reduce sediment, we can reduce phosphorus loads into, into water bodies, reduce runoff, reduce nitrogen leaching, um, and we can or increase organic matter. We can sequester carbon and store it in soil stored in vegetations. And that's the other thing about, you know, forests and perennial uh, plants is that not a, is that you're, you're sequestering it and you're storing it for a longer period of time. And of course, I would also say a wooden barn as opposed to a steel barn, um, that carbon is sequestered, is stored for a long time as far as using wood, uh, native wood in our, mm -hmm. our construction. So let's kind of take a look. Now that we've gone through some of these conservation practices, some of these concepts, look at, let's look on the left at these principles of regenerative agriculture, and let's look to see if we have the tools or the common conservation practices that can help us get there where we want to go as far as sustainability and regeneration of our, our soils and our landscape and our agriculture. So improving soil health, uh, we have cover crops, crop rotations, use green manure, reducing pesticide fertilizer use, doing soil testing, using integrated pest management. So we use the least amount that we need to get the job done, increasing biodiversity, using our rotations, using perennial crops, uh, protecting the ecosystems, our buffers, our pollinator plantings, disturbing the soil as little as possible. So reducing our tillage, no-till, keeping the soil covered, mulches, cover crops, keeping living roots in the soil, cover crops again, growing a diversity of crops, uh, crop rotations, agroforestry, integrating grazing livestock. That's a tough one because not everybody can do that. Mm. You know, not everyone wants to manage or can manage animals yes. on their farm. Um, and, you know, I mean, if you're a vegetable grower and you want to concentrate on vegetable growing, you should shouldn't have to have animals <laughs> part of your system. You may choose, and we need to have do a better job of distributing manure and nutrients from those that have animal agriculture to those that could use manure or compost from animal agriculture. So I think there's op plenty of opportunities there. Um, and this philosophy of, of a long-term land management plan of developing and implementing these conservation plans. And then also, as you said, of, of uh, if somebody is a successful farmer, they're practicing adaptive management. Mm. And that's, I think, also one of these biggest challenges of the unpredictability of farming in a changing climate with pandemics and supply chain issues and everything else is being able to 
pivot and oh to be God. as adaptive as, as possible. I don't know yeah. if you have any other thoughts as relates to, to that. Yeah. Okay. And then also, I think there's a lot that, that, uh, either that we need to learn or that it's, you know, that it's right to, to give recognition to of some of these practices that are, that are used by indigenous communities. So, uh, I think there's a lot of opportunities there as well. So I think we have a lot of the tools that we need. Again, I think part of the challenge is with, um, uh, you know, with globalization and of, uh, so we have, um, pests and diseases that we've never had before and will continue to do so. And that as, uh, as we warm, that there's also pests and diseases that we're going to have, um, that are going to be difficult. We don't know how to control and some of the inv invasive plants, particularly anything that's a vine, even if it's not invasive because the additional CO2 in the atmosphere, vines just love that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you're seeing grapevines, I'm sure just growing out in the middle of a hay field and poison ivy, like you've never seen before. Awful. So we've got it. We've got our, our challenges. So, and there is assistance available for these best manager practices, not only the technical assistance, but also financial assistance, um, that's available. In fact, um, USDA NRCS is going to have more money available for conservation practices and conservation planning. And this past legislative session, uh, Connecticut legislature passed dollars for climate smart agriculture and farmland restoration. So it's going to be $14 million available in Connecticut for climate smart agricultural practices and, and uh, 7 million of it for farmland restoration. So expect to see uh, additional opportunities to help with some of these conservation practices. And I would also like to see it to be able to be used for equipment purchase and for, uh, you know, shoring up, uh, farm buildings and getting them so that you have better better storage um, that they can hold up with wind shear and heavy heavy snow loads and some of those kinds of things as well. Better production so, areas. Better production safer, areas, yeah. more high tunnels, greenhouse opportunities, uh, better uh, wells, irrigation, cisterns, drainage systems, all those kinds of There's things. There's so many things that yeah. you could improve. That's right. So get get that Christmas list started. So, and then the other thing is too, is that we can't forget that, um, you know, agriculture and the food system is not separate from the rest of what goes on and it all needs to be integrated. And that's one of the things that we're not very good about is systems thinking, you know, so maybe there's something that you can do on Sullivan farm, but Sullivan farm is not on an Island with all the resources that you need. So we really need to think about these other kinds of, of systems and how they integrate with the, with the food system and do more of a systems thinking and life cycle planning. The fact that we don't have agricultural plastics recycling to any degree in Connecticut. So with the amount of agricultural plastics, and we're going to be probably using more of them, um, that that would be something that would be really helpful using technology and big data to help us address issues and challenges. You know, I'd like to see more because if people don't realize how many microclimates that we have in Connecticut, I'm sure you're even seeing on your farm here. And so having more local weather data and integrating that into a system to help you would Rain be, would be really helpful. Us. That's right. Yeah. Yep. Um, pay the true cost of what sustainably produced food is and subsidize if needed for folks. Um, you know, we talked a little bit about food hubs, diversifying our processors and distributors, um, invest in, in local and diverse food systems. So, and that's really, to me, the biggest challenge is to take this aggregated food system where you can have, you know, only four real meat processors in this country and diversify it back out. I mean, we've lost all that from the Northeast. We delegated it all to other parts of the country, other parts of the world. So the d diversifying it and making it more complex is gonna make it more resilient. So um, we need to work on that. We need support, as I said, we don't have all the answers, so we need more support for extension and research, technical assistance, invest in these climate smart and regenerative practices, uh, pay farmers and landowners for ecosystem ser services if they can't re get that dollar value in the marketplace. Um, I want farmers and food workers to have a living wage. 
um, support investment in land succession, reparation, and access for farmers. The biggest challenge for beginning farmers is land access, being able to afford land, land and having affordable housing. Because we do have, you know, particularly in Litchfield County, we have some land that people would would lease to you to farm, but you can't afford to live in the community, and there's no housing on the on the piece of property. So, um, and we need to use incentives and disincentive to to restore natural areas, protect them, and reuse gray fields and brown fields. We're so wasteful, you know. There's there's there. I live near the Buckland Mall, which is like mm. a dead mall. So doesn't it make more sense to reuse that property than to take a, a, a field or a piece of farmland and put a large scale solar array on it? Mm-hmm. So, and then uh, support federal, state, and local representatives who want to address these issues. We can do a lot more on reducing food waste, recycling, compost, reuse. You know, we know we want to get food waste out of the landfills mm-hmm. uh, because it does generate methane gas as far as emissions, and it can be valuable nutrients to use on the farm. Buy less processed packaged food, eat seasonally, shop at the Sullivan Farm Store, right? Prepare for the variability. It's a different shop way of- local. Yeah, different way of eating and cooking. Um, and in some cases, we need to help people know how to, how to cook a butternut squash, right? Yeah. How to cut it up and cook it. Eat locally, uh, ask our institutions, businesses, and groceries. Um, I know there's a bunch of beginning farmers that have a school contract or a restaurant contract and it's been really, or hospital contract, it's been really valuable to their, to them and their business. So support agriculture, forestry, and local food friendly regulations. That's a real challenge in Connecticut with 169 towns all doing their whole thing, not even using the same definition of a farmer agriculture, which is embarrassing. Um, so, you know, you might want to farm in a certain town. But if the regulations don't support animal agriculture um, or a farm stand or on-farm processing, it's, you're, you're not going to be successful. Uh, protect farmland, forest land, wetlands, repairing and recharge areas. And then again, you know, it's all, about, it's all about the land use. So the sprawl development is still our biggest threat to agriculture and uh, a sustainable food system mm-hmm. in Connecticut. <coughs> supporting public transportation, um, invest in renewable energy, energy conservation, conserve and reuse water. And then there's, um, for those that may not be familiar with it, a lot of the, the principles of, that are in sustainable ag and regenerative agriculture are also in this, the 16 principles of the Earth Charter. So, and I have a, a link here that people can, can go to and learn a little bit more about what that is, but uh, I think you would em- embrace it. Mm-hmm. So, and again, um, you know, I'm interested in keeping this planet alive. I'm not interested in getting on a small, smelly spacecraft and finding another planet. I want to keep this, this one planet. live and healthy. And I'm glad that you folks here at Sullivan Farm and people in town of New Milford are willing to help me get there. We want to spread the word because it's something that's important to our environment is farming just in general. And so we're glad that you came out and gave this presentation. It was wonderful. Excellent. Thanks. Yeah. We'll keep up, keep a good work with Sullivan Farm and in town of New Milford. Yes, of course. Thank Thanks. you so much. You bet. Thanks for the invitation.